everybody? Good sound check? Great. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm sure you guys are uh, going to be super attentive today because you guys got done with lunch and uh, you're filled up with uh, hopefully some good food from the conference here. Um, and so hopefully we can uh, stay, pay attention to me. Um, well, my name is Joshua Clark. Um, I'm actually uh, based out of uh, the West Coast and based out of San Francisco. I'm on a road tour uh, to do some shows this week, and this happened to be one of my stops. Um, I'm a uh, solutions architect for Checkmarks. Um, if for some of you that don't know of Checkmarks, Checkmarks is a, um, a company that develops products for source code analysis. So what we do is we scan source code uh, for vulnerabilities, so security defects like what we'll talk about today. These are the things that we do. Okay? And so the, the purpose of this talk today, the Node.js Highway Attacks at Full Throttle, this talk is basically uh, based on some research that we've done internally at Checkmarks on the new platform, Node.js. So how many of you guys have heard of Node.js? Okay, how many of you are actively developing programs on the Node.js platform? Okay, so it's, it's like a thing. New platform, you know, the same rules apply. So um, it's, it's interesting that people know about Node.js. They're kind of, you know, obviously probably why you came to this talk today is to find out, you know, what's the, what are some of the, you know, maybe security, impl security implications with the Node.js platform, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So, uh, like I said, um, at Checkmarks, what we did is we did some we did some research last year. We've done several talks on this. Um, that's what I'm here today is to talk to you about Node.js. We're going to talk about uh, here's our quick uh, agenda for today. So we're going to talk about the Node.js architecture. So for those of you that don't know about Node.js, I'll explain uh, the Node.js architecture. We'll then talk about the security implications of developing applications on a Node. JS platform. So if you have traditional web apps and you're moving them to a, a Node.js platform, uh, we're going to talk about some of those, those vulnerabilities associated with, uh, with Node.js. And so uh, some of the ones we'll talk about, I'm sure you guys know what DOS is, denial of service. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll, talk, we'll do a uh, kind of a code review on how um, part of, uh, with the Node.js platform, um, with uh, weak cryptography. So we'll talk about vulnerabilities there. We'll talk about uh, JSON SQL injection. So with Node.js, it's primarily server-side JavaScript. And you guys understand JavaScript is client-side, server-side. Node.js is a server-side JavaScript framework, which, which I'll explain the architecture in a minute. Um, and one of the vulnerabilities associated with, with that is uh, JSON uh, injection. Uh, another type of vulnerability that we discovered is a regular expression denial sort of service. So you know what regular expressions are. We'll talk about um, you know regular expression denial of service and how um, how that can affect a Node.js uh, platform. And then finally, uh, at the end, uh, we'll do some takeaway, just basically, you know, what are you getting out of this talk and what are you going to do uh, going after, uh, after the presentation? So let's talk about uh, the Node.js architecture. So um, Node.js is basically um, an event-driven framework that is comprised of uh, a single-threaded uh, single event loop, which is in the middle that's constantly listening for requests. Um, there is an event queue, so an event queue is basically going to be, uh, you know, those are the, the requests that come in, and the event loop constantly listens for those. And the whole purpose of doing a Node.js architecture is that you can get, you can have high response rate. So you're not you're not waiting for requests to process. It's it's very fast and very efficient. And also uh, the memory footprint for the process is very low as well. So Node.js uh, processes don't consume uh, a lot of memory uh, out of the box. So um, with this uh, with this architecture, you also have uh, the concept of callbacks, where you basically set a function and then it'll go off to do its work. For example, it might need to do file, uh, do I/O processing, or it might need to do database processing, or do network processing, and that um, that process will come back uh, into the loop and, and keep going. And so uh, this is kind of a very technical slide, but I like to I like to use this as an example of uh, a Node.js architecture. Um, I'm sure many of you have been to a fast food restaurant in the past, uh, you know, I don't know, past month or so. And uh, when you go to a fast food restaurant, uh, you go up, you're basically the event queue, right? You go up to the cash register and you put in your order and the register, the cash, cashier is basically the, the single thread, right? They process your request and they hand it off to an event handler, which could be multiple workers, which is basically that, that, uh, that, that loop thread that's basically going and processing uh, the request. And so event handler could be the other workers. Someone needs to go make a cheeseburger. Someone needs to go do fries and so on. So this is kind of a uh, human readable example of kind of how Node.js works. Does that kind of make sense to you guys somewhat? Yeah? 
cool. So let's talk about what this architecture means for you know development or even for InfoSec or why do we care, right? Well, when it comes to architecture of using Node.js, why would you want to do that? Well, there's there's good reasons to use Node.js and there's bad types of there's bad reasons to use it. So one of the good reasons to use Node.js would be an application that's doing high input, you know, I/O or for example, you need to talk to the database or you need an application that's going to have high user interaction, which is basically a web app, right? So different types of applications, like uh, any kind of app, web app that's uh, processing high user you know, throughput, Node.js would be a good platform to use that for. What is Node.js bad for? Well, Node.js is not good for doing high CPU intensive operations. So if I need to do some kind of uh, uh, large you know, algorithm or some kind of math function uh, that is going to do some processing on the CPU and consume the resources, not such a good idea. Okay, and I'll show you why here in a minute. And remember again, it's it's single-threaded process, um, so, so it's not multi-threaded, so, so be uh, understand that. And so, for example, our first type of vulnerability with respect to, to Node.js is a denial of service. So you guys can see this uh, basic, basic code right here. Right, all it is is doing a loop, and what it's doing is it takes a number, and it's going to count that number one through whatever the number you specify. For example, if I specify five, it's going to count one, two, three, four, five, and it's going to sum those numbers up. So it's going to do a, basically a CPU operation. Right? It's going to do some addition here in a loop. Now, I'll show you why that, why that's, uh, why that matters here. So it's going to be my first, uh, first demo, so uh, bear with me here. So I have this guy right here. And if we come over to my screen here, let me pull this guy. Of course, the, the demo breaks right away. Lost my desktop here. So that's what happens when you go into full screen and you lose your, lose your, lose your thing here. So I'm going to put back in. So displays, mirror. There we go. Okay. So now that you can see my screen again, what I want to show you is Basically, uh, I have a Node.js uh, application running here, and I'll show you. So if we come here to our task manager, you'll see that there is a node pro process here running, CPU zero, right? We run our, our so our node application, we'll run it. It's going to do a loop. It's a small operation. It just does one to, one to five, pretty basic. You know, didn't really hit the CPU. But now let's, let's, let's amp that up a little bit and try a larger number, right? Say 100 million, okay? Now what happens when you do a large number like that. Let's go back to our CPU. You can see here it's kind of um, crashing my, uh, well, that one went through, so let's go here and add another, another zero to it. So you can see here it's maximizing the CPU, right? So what does that mean? So that other request that I have, if I go back to the other, the other tab here, and I try to do a small operation, like sum of five, you see it's gonna have to wait for that other process to go and in the meantime, our task manager here, when it comes back, because my CPU is basically uh, pretty much over, um, basically I'm getting I'm denying myself of service because the, the process can't, can't respond because it's doing a high uh, CPU operation. As you can see here, my CPU is uh, using almost 100% of the CPU. It's a quad core box, so it's one of the cores is fully utilized. And so the point here is, with Node.js, if you don't, um, obviously in this, in this case you want to you know, check the inbounds of whatever you're accepting, but a high CPU intensive operation totally denies, is now denying my application of service. So any other user you know, that's trying to interact with this service um, is not going to be able to get a response. Okay? And so one of the, you know, and you can say this thing's going to take you know, however long it's going to take to process, but just a basic loop, like from one to whatever number I specify, um, is basically blocking uh, blocking the process, so no, no other, um, and again, because it's single-threaded, okay? So let's go back here to my presentation, why the, the processing endures in the back. So, denial of service, very basic demo, right? I just wrote a loop, one, two, 
100 million, and I can't, you know, the, the node instance is basically unresponsive. So imagine that in a business application, if you're trying to, you know, migrate your app to Node.js, you do the same thing. Somebody specifies a high number, or high CPU, or somebody codes in a, a bad function that's using the CPU or some kind of, you know, complex algorithm, um, denial of service right away. Okay, basically allocate all of our CPU. So let's look at another type of uh, vulnerability with respect to, uh, to Node.js. Um, what we were able to do is we did our research. Uh, again, we looked at open source uh, application. We saw an application out here. Um, you can see I blurred some of the code um, to protect the, you know, what it's actually doing. But basically, it's creating a new user account. Um, and it's actually, this, this actual piece of code um, uh, kind of competes with the OAuth uh, application code that generates that you guys uh, for, for open authentication. Does anybody see any problems out of the gate with this source code? There's a couple problems in here. MD5? Okay. What is, what is the, what's the security risk with using MD5? Right, so uh, MD5 is actually a pretty strong hashing algorithm, but it's easily reversible. There's uh, rainbow tables. Uh, any of you guys familiar with what a rainbow table is? Yes? No? Basically, a rainbow table is just basically a pre-computed hash of all the values that, for example, if I specify one and I MD5 hash that one through a billion, I have basically a table of all of those lookups. So it's easily reversible. I can basically, you know, there's rainbow tables available on the internet. For the example I'm going to show you, we actually created a, a fairly large rainbow table that we use for our demo. But yeah, MD5 is one of the, the things that's wrong with this, uh, this source code. Anything else? Okay, uh, was that her? Exactly, yes, weak PRNG. So math.random, right, is a random number generator based on the system. In this case, it's gonna be based on the node platform. Okay, so let's talk about, so, so yeah, with basically those two types of vulnerabilities we have in this source code, the math.random is not really random, right? Uh, it can be guessed, or it can be figured out, which we'll find out later. And then also MD5 is a, like I said, it's a hashing algorithm, but it's out of date. I mean, it's, it's, it's a fairly strong algorithm, but it can be reversed uh, fairly easy with, with rainbow tables. So why is this important and why do we care? Okay, well, V8, if you know, Google's V8 JavaScript engine, that runs inside of Chrome and also inside of the node process. Okay, so this should kind of interest you more, right? Because if you're going to migrate your applications to Node, you should be considered of the, the engines that's running within the Node process. So this is kind of a, a technical uh, diagram here to show with when you, when you do cite a random number generator, you have a seed value, okay? Use a seed value with a, with a state, which is another private value, and those values together create a random number. Now out of that random number, that's what's returned from math.random to the end user, and then the other state value is used in the next operation for the next generation of the next math.random number. Okay, now this research isn't primarily due to check marks, but uh, Amit Klein actually was able to detect this back in 2009. Uh, you can see the, the link that I posted there. Basically, um, they detected that the, the site of random number generator from V8 is actually uh, pretty weak. And so, Google, so Amit Klein was actually uh, the one that first detected this, this vulnerability. But this was in Google Chrome. But again, V8 is actually used in Node, so the same rules apply here for, uh, for a Node application. So what are we going to do with this? Why do, we, why do we care with this? Why do we care about this? Well, if we go back to our code example here, the purpose of that, that diagram and showing how those values are um, determined is if you can get the, if you can find out what those, those three random numbers are, you can basically find out what, you can actually guess what the next, uh, the next random number is going to be. Okay, so I'm going to show you kind of how we went through with our, you know, our research to actually find out how to guess, uh, guess passwords that were based off of this code block here. And so what do we need to do that? What do we need, how do we need to do that? Well, given three random new passwords, we should be able to determine uh, a future, uh, future number. Okay? And so first, what we're going to need to do is, what I said, we take the MD5, we're going to look that up. So we need to do a reverse uh, of the MD5 for the three passwords um, from the original the original random number that was generated. So that state diagram you saw there, the seed, and then the, uh, the numbers that are gonna, those three numbers that are gonna get generated, we're gonna get those. We'll get the hash, we'll reverse that, and then we're gonna basically compute the state variable to get the fourth consecutive random number, okay? And so the point is, of, again, why, 
why then do we, you know, why then do we care about this? Well, how many applications do you know? How many of you guys are using applications that have a forget password functionality? Probably everybody, right? Everybody forgets their password, and they, what do they do? They either send it to your email, or there's some random number generator that they're using to generate, uh, you know, a random password or a random number that then gets hashed. Okay. So let's take a look here and see how this is uh, how this is going to work. So, if we again, given three random numbers, uh, the value of that state zero and state one can then be inferred. So then all future values can be can be known in advance. However, Google knows about this. Right, because this Mick Klein guy, he he detected this back in you know 2009, reported it. Google looks at it as a low severity vulnerability within their engine because, uh, particularly with Chrome, every tab is its own process, right? And so every every tab is going to have its own you know its own state. So it's going to be pretty hard within uh, you know that's why Google kind of identifies this as a low severity finding. However, with respect to Node, which is what we're talking about. Node is a single process which could have multiple users that are trying to interact with it because you know, that's kind of how Node works, right? That's the whole, the whole purpose of, of this talk, right? And so if you have one Node process and you have multiple requests that are coming in, um, Node itself is just going to have one state value, and so you could potentially, um, you know, again, guess the, the next number, uh, the next random number in the, in the process. So let's look at a kind of a walkthrough of how we're going to do this, right? Kind of a, a diagram here. So for example, in a, in a web application, I'm a user. I go and I register. Um, you know, I register a user account. I get back a password. I register another user. I get back another password. So on and so on. And then basically, I'm going to have those three passwords, right? Now, once I have those passwords, right, I'm going to do my my lookup, right? Because I'll have the the actual the hash that's returned to me. Now I need to go look that up in the rainbow table, okay? So we're going to go back to our MD5 uh, rainbow table, take our taking our hash values, send those in. We're going to we're going to get back three clear random numbers. Okay. Now that we have those random numbers, we should be based on our, our re, based on MIT's research. You should be able to generate the the fourth uh, consecutive uh, the fourth number if you have all three in in, uh, in sequence. Okay. And so this is what we're going to do. Take all three of those numbers, and then we're going to basically try to find out what the fourth password is based on you know, math.random and based on our node instance. And so this is kind of the, you know, kind of our use case for what we're going to try to demonstrate here in a few minutes. Okay? So how many of you think it's going to work? One guy? Two guys? <laughs> okay. Well, let's give it a shot. So I'm going to go over here to my application here. And so just want to show you what I have running here. I have a Node.js application that's running here. It's listening on port 4990. And then I have a MongoDB server running here as, as another process. And so what I want to do is I want to go to my site. Now this is a secure site. Okay? It has a lock on it. Okay? That means it's secure. <laughs> have you guys ever seen a lock like that on the website? It means it's secure. Okay. So on my site here, I'm going to go ahead and test out a value here. I'm going to create a user <clears throat> called test1. My email, we're just going to say test. We're going to get my value here. This is my hash out value. We'll go ahead and put that here in my little thing, my little notepad, say value1. Or we'll call this, you know, this is for you, you know, this is user1. Let's go in here and create another user. Paste this in here, value2. And then I'm going to come here and do another three. Register this guy again. And so essentially, what have I done, right? If we use that same code that was in that demo there, value three, right? So I have three hashes that I've created, math.random, md5 hash, three values I've generated. Now what am I going to do with this? I'm going to go back here to my fancy VR, V8 site of random number generator. And I'm going to basically take the MD5 decoder. So I've got to get the values, right? So we come here and grab our value, value 1. Take this guy, paste it in here, and brute force it. There's our value in our lookup. <clears throat> Snooze this guy, so it doesn't annoy me here. And then we'll go back and grab our second value. Now, obviously, you know, doing this demo here, um, you know, this could all be scripted too because you're not going to be doing it as a, um, 
you know, th this whole process could be scripted so that, it, you know, if you think about random numbers, you know, other people, other people could be coming in like while I'm talking and, and generating passwords, which could ruin my, my demo. So keep that in mind. But there's nobody else using the system, so it's just me. And so now I have these three values here. So remember, if we go back to Amit's research, we've given the, given the values of those three random values. Let's see if it works. So let's start crunching those numbers for Node.js to see what our, um, our third uh, password or basically our third hash is going to be. Let's see if it works. Crossing my fingers. Okay. So we have a hash here, which is 9C. This would be our expected. So if I went, this is going to be my expected value. I come back here, test four. I think that looks pretty pretty much the same. What do you think? Anybody agree? Round of applause. Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Thanks. Okay, so the point here is I have a web application, right? I've taken three random values I've generated. Same thing in a forget password setup. You can do the same thing, and if you can, can't see the screen up there, the numbers are exactly the same. So um, same thing in a web app. You know, weak crypto, this is important, right? So you want to make sure if you're Using code that's generating passwords, you want to use a strong crypto algorithm, not a weak one, because it can easily be guessed. OK, so let's go back to the demo here. I'll go back to the presentation. So what's next in our, our talk here? Um, MongoDB. So MongoDB, how many people know about MongoDB? How many people care about MongoDB? <laughs> Same people, OK. All right, so MongoDB, um, traditionally, it's, it's a NoSQL database. So what is NoSQL? Well, when I was doing my research on NoSQL, because I traditionally know like SQL Server, Oracle, these types of data structures, um, when I learned about NoSQL, I was like, well, NoSQL is not NoSQL. It's just not only SQL types of databases, like you know, SQL Server and Oracle. So MongoDB is a document-oriented architecture, right? So instead of tables, you have documents. Instead of rows, you have collections, OK? So documents, um, it's a document database. And it's get, everything gets stored as a JSON object, right? So you have JSON documents in a database. Um, have you guys, how many of you have heard of the, uh, of a mean, the mean stack? Mean stack? A couple guys up here? Okay. Cool. So mean stack is Mongo, right, for your database, Express for your front end, Angular for, for JavaScript, and then Node.js as your platform for your, your server. Okay, so the mean stack. A lot of people are migrating to the mean stack, and that's kind of what, what we should talk about here. So with, with Mongo, right, totally different, uh, different data structure, um, and I'm going to show you kind of why we uh, care about this. So again, um, the architecture of a Mongo database, you know, you have your, your document, and then you have your collections, and you want to insert something in. So you basically insert things in. Uh, you can insert an item here with card quantity 15. Then with the next, the next uh, record that I want to in insert in there, I insert a name, elephant, with size you know, 1,700. So it's a totally different structure or totally different field values. Do Mongo doesn't care about what the, what the string is because it's just a JSON object, right? And so it doesn't really matter here for, uh, you know, that, that's kind of how this is different. Typically, you have, you know, with traditional databases, you have columns that are specific on the data type. Uh, JSON is just a block, you know, basically a JSON object. So it can have all kinds of values inside it. So when you go to insert in, to insert the data in, that's what it looks like. If you want to retrieve the data, right, you can just call a dot find on the collections. It'll return back all the items. Okay, you can do a selection criteria. So you could do find. So show me all the products that have the quantity of 15. Then you can also do filter criteria. So show me all the products that have, show me all the products that have a quantity greater than 15. Okay, and these are kind of so I can actually write in my own JSON object to return back items. And why does that matter? So if you look down on the, the bottom piece of code there, var object, I create an object, and then object quantity equals 15, and then I can basically search based on that JSON object. Okay, so kind of a new way of of doing, uh, you know, CRUD operations against uh, a different type of data structure. Not traditional, you know, I need a SQL string to go get me some, some values out. Okay? So parameterized, basically it's parameterized uh, JSON. So uh, when it comes to security, though, what, is this, uh, what, what does this mean right here with, uh, with respect to, um, what, what is this vulnerability? I'm sure you guys have seen this before. Yes? 
Yes, SQL injection, right? So this is traditionally, if I want to, you know, write, uh, I want to extract data out of a database, I usually have a select command from, you know, users where username equals user supplied values, username and password in this case. And we all know that this is, you know, SQL injection because I could, you know, if you have code like this, I could obviously bypass the, the filtering mechanism and supply my own values so I could do SQL injection. So, with, uh, well, what about with NoSQL, right? There's no SQL going on. So is there, so th with the MongoDB, there's no SQL injection, right? Is there SQL injection in this code here? Say that again? Yeah, yeah, so, so in this case, um, yeah, the same thing, right? We, we just pass in username value, but because there's no SQL, there's no SQL injection, right? Wrong. Because in the same case here, Right? I can still, I'm still just passing in those values and I'm creating a JSON object. And I'll show you here um, in a minute why this uh, could be bad, right? So you take that request.query.username, request.query. So this again, this is uh, node code here, right? So this is my node code, get my username and password. I call my Mongo database, just pass in my username and my password. Now, what happened? Now, since we know that this is basically creating a JSON object, Right? There's also specific operators within JSON, specific to Mongo, that can be used in that JSON object that gets created. Right? There's an operator called a greater than operator. Okay? So all I need to do, right, because I'm supplying the username and I'm supplying the password, dollar sign GT is basically greater than A for the username and greater than password. What do you guys think that's uh, going to be able to do? Well, I'll show you <laughs> in the demo here. Actually, go back here before I get to the demo. Let's slow down a minute. So basically, um, what, what, with that greater than operator that I have that I can pass in, it's basically going to allow me to, you know, if I do my same lookup here, if I want to look up the users based on my user supplied values, username and password, I'm going to do, do the call the find method. And basically, what that's going to create for me is a user, but it's going to create a, a, a signature that's going to talk to the node server with username and password. But if I supply those greater than operators uh, right after the user object, right, basically I'm going to have, you know, talk to my server, go do my lookup, user greater than A and user and password greater than A. What do you think that's going to return? Let's go ahead and take a take a look, see here at the demo and show you uh, how that works. So we go back here to my demo machine, and we go to this guy here. So that's localhost 49. There we go. So let's do this. Uh, let's just go to our site here, and so this is, let's go to our base site. And so here is my, my base simple site that's a front end node. It's talking to a, uh, again, talking to the Mongo database. So let's try to log in as a, an admin user. Submit our query. Great, we're an administrator, right? So it took admin, admin, that was the password. So let's go back in here and let's try it again. Let's try it as admin and then try it with a, you know, a phony password or one that we don't know. Okay, so it failed, it didn't work. So I logged in as admin, it worked. I logged in as a uh, incorrect password and I wasn't able to log in. Okay, so now that we have this, instead of typing in, let's do our greater than function, greater than a and greater than so this case, we'll just copy this so I don't fat finger it. Okay, so that do it here because it's not going to accept. So user greater than ampersand password greater than a. That's what I messed up. I didn't do the thing. So this, right, this is me doing a username and password. Now this shouldn't, this should kick me out, right? Well, I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> there we go. We'll go back to this guy. Next time I'll just have this scripted so it's much easier. So passes 
greater than greater than equals a and then for this guy let's do our greater than a and there we go I just hit that and it requested and it returned me back as an administrator okay and I don't know if you guys can see that because it's kind of dull but um, if you can see the text up there I did my greater than equals I did user greater than a and you know the password greater than a so essentially what I've done is I've been able to perform SQL injection against a non SQL database okay so obviously in this case right we still have you know like I said this is uh, SQL injection or SQL injection against a Mongo a Mongo database okay come back here it's my presentation again so what are some you know what are some ways to um, to prevent this right right how, how could I how could I prevent this well what happens if I just uh, you know I don't look up the password I just look up the users and then I do some kind of compare against the candidate password and the and the, the password in the, in the look you know that's that's already supplied right so what about that still not gonna work okay because if I'm allowed to pass in as a user, if I'm allowed to pass in my username, I could basically then pass in my own uh, JSON object, which as you've seen there, uh, there's a greater than object. There's about 30 other different types of operators that, that, that are used or basically serialized, or not serialized, but are used within um, Mongo that allows you to kind of perform your own operator operations. For example, the next type of one that we're going to look at here is um, regular expression, right? Because I could, you know, if I pass in my username from the client, I can supply that value. What's to stop me from supplying my username and then supplying a regular expression on top of that to then look up uh, another value? And then um, this can lead to regular expression denial of service through, um, through the same, same construct here, right? Supply my username, and then I'm basically crafting that request, and so I can supply in a red, regex. Now, regex is another dollar, you know, dollar sign regex, just like dollar sign greater than or you know, dollar sign less than. And then I can supply my own regex. Now, you supply your own regex function. What is regex normally going to require from a computer? Or from a, I don't want to give it away. What is it, what is the CP, what, what is regular expression uh, doing? Like, what's what is it using to 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 do to check for a match? CPU, okay. And what are Node applications bad at? CPU intensive operations, okay. So, regular expression denial of service. If I have a um, a regular expression that's fairly complex, what's that going to do to my node instance? Denial of service. Regular expression denial of service. Okay? Remembering that Node.js is highly sensitive to CPU operations, there's a single thread for the user code. Redos, or regular expression denial of service, is going to basically deny my application of service. Okay? This is my last fancy demo of the day. This is basically a blurb of a regular expression that I've you know, crafted up here. So you can obviously go up to OWASP and take a look at this. Um, there is, uh, you know, the thing that's tricky about regular expressions is you got to be careful. You just don't create some, you know, arbitrary regular expression. Most people are doing, you know, passwords or doing email structure, you know, for, you know, have a specific email address or other types of, you know, validation expressions. Um, again, you got to remember with Node.js, if you allow the user to supply any of those values, they can create their own. Um, or if you are writing your own regular expression and you write one that's going to eat up a lot of the CPU, you could have, uh, again, denial of service with your Node app. And so, with this guy here, we'll come back to my demo machine here and supply this guy. Hmm. Come on. Well. Okay, well, I'm two for three in the demo, so it's not working. So, you know, hopefully I get a passing grade. So, whatever. But I know this works. Um, it's just not responding here. But anyways, regular expression, you can take a look at the blog. It's definitely a vulnerability that you should consider when you're looking at Node.js applications. And um, it's definitely something that's uh, um, important when it comes to Node.js architecture, too. So, let's go back here. Uh, I'm going to basically uh, talk a little bit more about our, you know, some of the, 
the key takeaways from what we talked about here today in our presentation. And so the Node.js architecture, a key takeaway is that, you know, we have a new platform that we're trying to migrate our applications to. Many uh, large software vendors have started migrating, you know, IBM, HP, Microsoft, a lot of people have started to move their applications to the Node.js architecture. So there's obviously, um, based on what we found out today, there's, you know, if I had more time, I would go through a lot more vulnerabilities, but with the time that we have, you know, these are some of the, you know, just by looking at the architecture, you can see out of the box, there's a, quite a few, uh, three main uh, uh, vulnerabilities that we found. You know, denial of service, weak crypto, JSON SQL injection, and even regular expression denial of service. What I like to say about this is, you know, it's a new platform, you know, same rules apply, right? So when we first started doing application security and looking at other platforms, you know, we had to go through all the different vulnerabilities, and then we have a new platform like Node.js, same types of vulnerabilities, new platform, okay? So, uh, one other thing I found in doing my research, uh, Node Security, they, ask, they have a specific uh, website. If you want to do your own research or look into Node.js and find things, you can contribute back to nodesecurity.io, um, be a contributor to the, to the platform. Um, particularly when it comes to, you know, with this presentation, using uh, code within Node.js, if you're writing Node.js applications or migrating uh, applications from traditional apps to the Node platform. Always validate the input length. Always make sure you're validating any kind of user supplied uh, input. Anything that's coming from the user, make sure you're validating that against a, a whitelist, uh, depending on the you know the use case, and allowing permitted care you know the specific characters, not just allowing the user to supply any value. Some other takeaways is that each coding language has its own pitfalls, right? Certain languages are good at certain things. Scripting languages, you know, good at some things. You know, other compiled languages are, are better at other types of applications. So be mindful of your architectures. Um, and if you're moving, migrating your apps to Node.js, um, be considerate of these types of, uh, these types of vulnerabilities. Um, and make sure you understand a language and it's, and what it can do. So Node.js, server-side JavaScript, um, if you allow that to execute, I mean, these are just some of the basic vulnerabilities that we have. There's a, a bunch more, um, that we, you know, that we can scan for and detect. Um, and again, remember the concept of Node.js is it, it's a highly, you know, anything that requires high CPU, any kind of task that is doing that's require high CPU is going to uh, give you a denial of service uh, on your application. And so we are, um, and so with that, um, I'm kind of done with my, my presentation. Um, if you want to stop by uh, the Checkmarks booth to learn more about our product and how we can detect just these vulnerabilities and even more, uh, feel free to stop by and I can give you more of a deeper dive. Um, but with that, I'm going to leave it for Q&A. So thank you. Any, any, uh, any questions for me? Okay. Well, thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. I appreciate your time. Thank you.